fundamentally, it's a much more divided society than that which we live in today. So we worry today about the rich and the poor. In the 13th century, 80-90% of the population lived at subsistence level, and then a tiny political elite at the head of society, which could include some people living in towns, but for the most part restricted to the aristocracy and the king. They control everything. And also it's a very religious society, so it's a society where Christianity is a daily part of people's lives and where certain assumptions about the way the world works are taken for granted. Society reflects God's intentions for the world and therefore that above everybody there is God. And um, politics and religion and social behaviour are all conditioned by that belief in God. So today we might think of an ideal way of making a constitution, but we wouldn't really be worrying whether God was on its side, at least not in this country. Um, in the 13th century, we're thinking of a society that would much more resemble parts of the Middle East today, where what matters about politics is it, it reflects the mind of God. Plantagenet government was very much a kleptocracy. It was about collecting as much of you could, as you could of everything for the king. Uh, it was about land, it was about money, but what mattered about government as far as the king was concerned was that government would continue to enable the king to do what he wanted to do. And what he wanted to do is conquer land, seize other people's resources, and generally become richer and richer. You've got to bear in mind here that English history is dominated by the Norman Conquest of 1066. The Plantagenets came after that, and they wanted to repeat that level of success that William the Conqueror had got by conquering England in 1066. So, for a start, they felt themselves to be somewhat overwhelmed by the Norman past. They were always conscious of the fact that they were a new family and that they had to do something really rather special. And secondly, the only way that you could really out-Norman the Normans would be by conquering even more land than the Normans had conquered. So we've got to bear in mind that behind King John's thinking lay this whole tradition of English history that he was competing against. King John followed very much the same tradition of government that his father Henry II and his brother Richard I had followed. So Magna Carta and the political program that surrounds it is a reaction against a whole tradition of this Plantagenet kingship. We sometimes call it Angevin kingship because these people came from Anjou on the River Loire. But in manipulating Angevin kingship, John behaved in a way that the barons found unacceptable, whereas his father and brother had, ex had behaved in ways that, however bad, the barons had come to accept. So John was criticised for doing very much what his family had always done. But in the past, Henry II had had a stream of mistresses, had locked up his own wife, had gone to war against his own sons, had been accused of complicity in the murder of his Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Becket. King John didn't really do anything quite as awful as all of that. And yet, John was blamed by the barons, whereas Henry II somehow got away with it. That tells us, I think, something very important about the personality of these two men. Henry II was a deeply impressive person. John wasn't. We're told by the chronicler Matthew Paris that foul as is hell, hell itself is made more foul for the presence of King John. And I think that that view of John has really run down the ages, and against it, there's been very little reaction. John was suspicious. He was untrustworthy. He was lecherous. He was greedy. He was obsessed with treasure. Above all, he was a failure as a military commander. He did not have the personality to command troops in battle or to win victories for his side. And that failure to win victories lies behind an awful lot of what went on in the politics of John's reign. So was Magna Carta inevitable or could it have been avoided? That's a very interesting question. 
If you think of English history in a much longer spectrum, England could well have gone the same way as France. It could have developed towards a more and more autocratic style of kingship, a more centralised style of kingship, uh, a style of kingship based on great palaces, a style of government that was based entirely on the king. It didn't. I suspect that that was very much down to the personality of John himself early in the 13th century that brought about the crisis from which Magna Carta emerged. And then, perhaps even more significantly, the lack of personality of his son, Henry III. Because it's really what happened after John's death that turned Magna Carta from a short-term settlement into a much longer-term, totemic, some would say, solution to the problems of how to bind the king to the law. It's very important here that we bear in mind that Magna Carta 1215 is not the document that's gone down, as it were, as the law that we call Magna Carta. That's something that comes afterwards. That's a, a rethinking of Magna Carta in the 13th century, above all the, the issue of Magna Carta in 1225. The 1215 Magna Carta, which is much longer, which has got 61 or so clauses, each one of those clauses is a direct response to the particular circumstances of 1215 or the particular crimes of King John. And in each one of those clauses, we can find an example of something of which the king had been accused, which the king had done wrong. So what, what had John done that was so ghastly? Um, well, he had murdered his nephew, Arthur of Brittany, in 1204. 1202. Uh, we don't know because nobody ever found the body. But at some point, round about 1202, 1203, Arthur disappeared. And it was generally rumoured that the king had either murdered him with his own hands or got someone else to do it. Kings of the past had locked up rebellious members of their family, but they had not killed them. Crime one. John lusted after not just low-born courtesans, but the women of his court, the wives of his barons. Now, we don't know for a certainty that that was the case, and the king's illegitimate children all seem to have been born before he became king. So there's some degree of uncertainty here, but there was enough rumour circulating, there was enough smoke to suggest that there really was a fire there somewhere, and that the king's personal life was far from blameless. Then, he was a man, John, of very close friendships, but those friendships had a regular tendency of going disastrously wrong. Kings of the past have been surrounded by loyal men, and on the whole, they'd remain loyal to their followers. John fell out with many of his favourites. We can see that in a number of instances. Two will suffice. First of all, when he became king, he ditched a large number of the men who'd been with him when he'd been a mere earl, a mere count in France. So he was disloyal to his own followers. And then, most famously of all, he turned against, as it were, the best-made man at his court, a man named William de Brose, from Normandy, but who was rewarded with lands in Ireland and in South Wales and in England, who was made enormously rich by King John. Well, John disgraced him. He pursued him to death. Brose died in exile in France as a martyr to Plantagenet tyranny. And Brose's wife and child were both starved to death, some say in Windsor, some say in Corfe. Now, these were really big crimes. These were serious things that the king did wrong. But there's one other thing that the king did wrong, I was going to say wronger, than all of those things, and that was that he was unsuccessful in war. Maybe he could have murdered his nephew. Maybe he could have fallen out with his friends. Maybe he could have disgraced his courtiers. But he lost all of the wars in which he fought. He lost Normandy, and in 1214, he failed to reconquer it. And those were crimes that no king could get away with. They were a sign that God himself had turned against the king. John's relationship with the papacy is a seesaw affair, you see. So we start with this business where king and pope are divided. They both have a political agenda which clashes. Above all, they have a different agenda for who they want to see made bishops. The pope wants good churchmen, the king wants good, obedient public servants. 
And all of that came to a head with this papal interdict on England, where the king refused to accept the pope's candidate as Archbishop of Canterbury, a man named Stephen Langton, where the pope declared the king excommunicated and placed England under an interdict, no church services, all of the mass, all of the burial of the dead in consecrated ground, all of that came to an end. But in many ways, the king was extremely politically astute. And therefore, when things began to get difficult for him towards the later years of that interdict, he did a complete about turn and made himself appear the most loyal son of the Pope. He placed England under direct feudal lordship from the Pope. He declared England and Ireland to be papal fees. And then in 1215, just before the issuing of Magna Carta, he declared that he would go and fight in the Pope's crusade and as a result, placed himself under all the protections that the church offered to crusaders. It's often said that um, the Pope annulled Magna Carta. The king appeals Magna Carta to the Pope, and the Pope annulled it. There is some element of truth in that. So the Pope could not accept a system like this, which seemed to place a committee of barons above the king. A Pope claimed to be a sovereign ruler under God, a king likewise. No Pope could accept that sort of limitation on sovereignty. So it's true that by September 1215, both the Pope and the King were busily repudiating Magna Carta. But there's another side to that story. Magna Carta survived thereafter only because a series of the Pope's representatives in England, these people we call papal legates, decided that it should be reissued, now revised, as a manifesto of good government on behalf of John's infant son, Henry III. And those subsequent reissues of Magna Carta, which survived, 1216, 1217, are sealed not by the king, but by the Pope's representative in England. So the Pope actually becomes the guarantor of Magna Carta. And by the 1250s, we actually find the Pope, in effect, issuing full-scale rehearsals of Magna Carta and the obligations of the people in England to obey Magna Carta. Why? Because, of course, Magna Carta Clause 1 includes the liberties of the church. So just as the king seesaws from being the pope's enemy to being the pope's friend, so the pope goes from seeing Magna Carta as something that's obnoxious to seeing something in it that really protects the interest of the church, that indeed creates a privileged status for the church under English law. I think the Magna Carta isn't so much a revolutionary as a deeply conservative document, but there are a number of different opinions on that subject. Some would see it as deeply revolutionary in that it does indeed place the king under the law. It even appoints a committee of 25 barons who are permitted to rebel against the king should he break his own law. Now, that is a revolutionary departure from what had been permitted or permissible in the past. But in looking for longer-term solutions to the immediate problems of John's reign, the barons were necessarily conservative. They looked back to the sorts of feudal difficulties that kings had had with their barons in the 12th century. They looked back to a combination of English law that goes back long before the Norman Conquest, and also to the coronation charters of the 12th century English kings. And from that, they concocted a political program. So the political program of Magna Carta is actually very conservative. It's an attempt to return to a mythical golden age where all had gone well, where right and justice and liberty had triumphed. How could kings get the consent of their people for taxation? This was a big problem throughout the 12th century, indeed, before that. And there had been a regular series of meetings, we'd call them great councils, throughout the 12th century and earlier times, where kings had had to consult with their men. Those were informally regulated, so there was no actual list of those that had to come. There were certain people who were taken for granted, the earls, the bishops, and then there were others who were summoned on a more or less ad hoc basis, the great barons and sometimes the knights. But the, the, the whole point here in Magna Carta is that Magna Carta begins to demand that taxation cannot be taken without the consent of the, the community of the realm. 
And that leads on inevitably to the idea of no taxation without representation, which became, of course, the great rallying cry of the American colonists in the 17th century. Tax has always been a highly politicized issue, and it's there at the center of the political agenda in 1215. It's vitally important that we remember that Magna Carta wasn't forgotten after John's reign. The Magna Carta that John issued died within 12 weeks. It was a dead letter. It was an attempt to make peace, and it failed. It was annulled by the Pope. It was repudiated by the king and by the barons who effectively rebelled against him. It was saved, and it became of central significance in English politics thereafter, throughout the 13th century. It was saved because of the circumstances of John's death. John's councillors now surrounding this boy king reissued Magna Carta again in 1217, and then again in 1225. And it was really reissued, and statements were made in its support throughout the 13th century. It was last reissued in 1300. So it played a central role in the debate between king and barons throughout the 13th century. It didn't die even thereafter. It lived on. It was remembered throughout the later Middle Ages. Kings regularly promised to reenact the liberties of Magna Carta. What I think happened to make the 17th century interest in Magna Carta so important, the use of it by people like Cook, by the common lawyers of the early 17th century, is that they turned it once again into a revolutionary political program. Whereas previously people had paid lip service to the liberties that Magna Carta contained, the constitutional lawyers of the early 17th century actually began to demand that Magna Carta acquire teeth and be used to really restrain the tyranny of the Stuart kings, first of all James and then Charles I. For a start, you've got the Hollywood view of Magna Carta, which is in some way, it is the English constitution, it's the foundation stone of democracy, it's all of those things. Now, the historians wouldn't really accept quite a lot of that. They would say that quite a lot of that is heavily mythologized. Magna Carta is very much a feudal document. But you've got that totemic significance of having this piece of parchment that people can refer to as the basis of our rights. And then you've got the whole exciting story of King John's reign, and you've got the focus of attention on John's reign, not only because there is such an awful king ruling England, but because we get the introduction to that story later on of the Robin Hood legend, of the whole idea of Richard I and the Crusades, the whole idea that this, as it were, was the real flowering, the great moment of climax in medieval English history before we enter the much more destabilized period later on, the period of the Black Death, the period of the Wars of the Roses. So, as it were, this is, this is still the era of the big beasts and it's been very heavily mythologized. 